To my left is Lindsay Karras Stencil, who is the COO and fund manager of Launch New York. Uh, this is Julie Lenzer, the chief innovation officer at University of Maryland. And at the far end is Allie Burns, the CEO of Village Capital, um, and also previously with Revolution's Rise of the Rest Fund. Um, so I wanted to start off and just have each of our panelists give a little bit of background on who they are, what their organization is about, uh, and a little bit of their, their story. Sure. So, yeah. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming today. Uh, so, my name is Lindsay Karras Stencil. I wear a couple hats every day. So, I'm the COO and fund manager for Launch New York. Launch New York is a 501c3 venture development organization focused on bringing venture capital and growing high growth startups in the 27 westernmost counties of the state of New York because all of the capital tends to go to New York City, but turns out there's more to the state of New York than just New York City. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we work really hard there. We have um, the we had the um, tenth most active seed fund in the country uh, last year, and uh, we are seeking to beat that this year. We have 14 transactions closing in the next two weeks, oh. so buckle up. It's going to be a fun ride. Uh, in addition to that, I'm uh, one of the managing partners and chief legal counsel for a venture capital firm out of Columbus, Ohio, called NCT Ventures, where we are an early stage uh, venture fund, always looking for the next cool thing. So that's a little bit about me. I'm a recovering attorney. I'm licensed in multiple states, so that's always fun, too. <laughs> Good. Well, I, uh, Julie Lenzer, I'm a recovering entrepreneur. Uh, I'm also a, recoverment, a recovering government appointee. I used to be the director of the Office of Innovation and Entrepreneurship. So do we have any regional innovation strategies, I6, seed fund winners here? Anybody that's won those grants? No, that's shot. See, there's I, lots I of know. opportunity. Yeah. I told you there was. Right. Um, just to give you an idea, the Office of Innovation and Entrepreneurship, we helped fund and build entrepreneurial ecosystems across the U.S. And in fact, um, I believe it's been $57 million that we've put in, into play as grants to communities across the U.S., uh, which I was able, I was there for two and a half years. I was part of the Obama administration and had to leave at noon on January 20th, but uh, that's the way that works, always. Uh, so I'm now the Chief Innovation Officer at the University of Maryland. I decided because government wasn't a big enough problem to try an entrepreneur that now I'm going to take on academia. <laughs> It's worse than the federal government in many <laughs> ways. I'm not lying. Um, there's a lot of uh, barriers, and that's why they need entrepreneurs, because we are possibility thinkers. We're persistent. Uh, we keep trying to find a way, and that's what I'm trying to do in academia. How can academia? My job at the university is to unleash innovation. So for students, faculty, and alum. So we'll talk more about some of the things that we're trying to do and some of the things we've done in the past. So thank you. Hi, I'm Allie Burns. Um, I'm not sure yet what I'm recovering from, but we'll <laughs> get there in, in a few years. And I'm saying hi to the folks who can't really see. Um, so I run Village Capital. We provide support to seed stage entrepreneurs, both in the form of investment readiness training and access to capital. And we look for entrepreneurs who are sitting in what we call investor blind spots. So we look for entrepreneurs who are trying to solve a specific set of problems. When you look at uh, the most valuable companies in the world, the so-called so unicorns, uh, um, less than 20% of them are actually solving problems in areas that uh, matter for us to have healthy and productive lives. So areas like education, financial inclusion and financial health, food and agriculture. And we're looking for entrepreneurs who are trying to solve these really hard problems to increase economic opportunity and provide environmental uh, sustainability. Um, and we also look for entrepreneurs who are outside of the three states who get 75% of most venture capital, so New York, California, in Massachusetts get 75% of US venture capital and 50% of global venture capital. And we also look for entrepreneurs who are underrepresented. Um, less than 10% of venture capital goes to companies founded or co-founded by women. Less than 1% companies founded or co-founded by people of color. So there's a lot of opportunity that has not yet been tapped um, when it comes to investing in early stage companies that we're really excited about providing. Over the last nearly 10 years, we've trained about 1,200 entrepreneurs. Um, and through our seed stage fund, we've made about 100 investments. So um, we're not quite as busy um, as some of the others on the panel here, but uh, we, we do have a very active portfolio. I'm really excited about both the traction that these companies are getting and the impact that they're making in the world. Awesome. I think that's that's a great lead off. Um, one of my initial questions was, you know, Ali already stated the, the 
the fact that gets cited a lot, which is that the lion's share of venture capital in the U.S. is located in three markets, New York, uh, Boston, and San Francisco. Um, and I think we have a very unique uh, group of panelists today, entrepreneurs and investors, who have a, uh, a view of all of the uh, financial opportunities outside of those markets um, and at a very national level. So I guess the first question I wanted to ask you know, each of you, if you could give us your input, is um, you know, tell us what's out outside of those three areas that you're seeing. Help us get into the mindset you know, of what you're looking at and how they value investments. Um, and just give us, give us kind of a perspective on that. Uh, sure. So I'll jump in um, because I spend a lot of time running around the Midwest of the United States, the flyover states, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we like to look at it this way. The West Coast has the Internet. The Midwest has the things. And if you think about where a lot of technology is moving, be it robotics and AI and things of that nature, and, and you have to transport those, you know, transportation, all that stuff. The Midwest, if you're located, say, in central Ohio, you can get to 80% of the U.S. population within one day's drive. So for us, that's an amazing opportunity because, you know, you can get to all of those, those great places very easily and you can transport, be it your good, your product, whatever. But on top of that, the cost of living is dramatically reduced. So when we look at investment opportunities out of the West Coast, and I'm not knocking my West Coast uh, counterparts, but it's dramatically more expensive to pay developers and teams out on the West Coast than it is, you know, in Western New York or Central Ohio or, you know, be it somewhere in Indiana. Um, so it's an opportunity to be able to take the same amount of capital and theoretically double the amount of output that you can you can do. So you know where you'd hire a coder for 250 in in San Francisco, you can hire him for 150 in central Ohio, and you think about the value there. I will say we also are much more realistic about valuations. <laughs> We've got that good old Midwestern mentality, so uh, we want people to not only you know, tell us the, the opportunity that is there, but we want them to kind of prove it a little bit too. So we have much more realistic um, metrics that we tie to as opposed to um, just tying to, hey, we're buying a percentage of business as you might see in some other places, we're saying, okay, okay, what's the actual value you're creating based on each milestone in, in each investment tranche, if you will. So lots of opportunity in the Midwest. Uh, pitch for Columbus, Ohio. Uh, Forbes <laughs> stated that Columbus, Ohio was the number one city for startups in 2018 in October. Uh, Cincinnati was number six. And there's a laundry list of other folks, you know, between, you know, the, the Mississippi and, and Nevada that were also named. So I challenge you to, to look in those areas, too, because I think there's there's a ton of investment opportunity for any person in this room. It's funny because I will actually, my business was seated in Dayton, Ohio, and yeah. Cincinnati, Ohio, because Procter & Gamble was my sugar daddy. Hey so it hey was great. Um, the, the more that I travel across the world and across the country, um, what I see is that good ideas are not just relegated to a certain demographic or geography. There are great ideas everywhere. And being at the university, I see uh, we have a, a faculty member who has cured multiple sclerosis in a mouse. We have someone who is creating a quantum computer that is competing with Google and IBM. There are amazing things going on. And this is just the University of Maryland. There are amazing research and ideas all across the country. What they don't have, perhaps, that someone in Silicon Valley, Boston, or um, New York might have, New York City, I think, also has this, is the density of talent and capital. Mm -hmm. But ca it's not just about the capital. It's also about the talent, to your point. It's about finding the workforce that you need to develop your company. It's about finding the business expertise when you have the idea. Just because you have the idea, doesn't mean that you're the one that should be the CEO. And we see this especially within academia. Um, faculty members think they want to be the CEO until they have to start making payroll and have to do all this boring stuff that has nothing to do with their research. And so um, I would say that uh, I think there's actually more opportunity outside of these, these capital intensive areas because there are great ideas that just need their ecosystem to cultivate and bring the resources to them. And that's, to your point, is where the good deals are, actually. 
Yeah, and uh, Julie, it's funny you mentioned P&G because I think one of the other advantages of sitting outside of maybe some of the major tech hubs is connection to, particularly in the sectors where we invest, um, connections to strategic partners, yeah. so corporates to universities. Um, when you're solving a problem in healthcare, being in Nashville, which is a huge hub for healthcare and health systems, or in Houston, um, there is a huge opportunity to be able to tap into those strategic partners, and both in terms of uh, customer base, but also in terms of thinking about where you go as you build your company towards an exit. So there's a big yeah. advantage to being. The, the best capital for any places. company is a paying customer. Exactly. <laughs> well, and now we have our additional panelists. This is Tim Huang, the founder and CEO of Fiscal Note. Tim, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and what the inspiration was for starting your company and, and how you fundraised thus far? Sure, yeah. So uh, apologies for being late here. I just got off a flight from, from Dulles <laughs> not, not an hour ago or so, an hour oh. and a half. Um, uh, no, I, I so uh, pleasure to be here. You know, my name, as, as I said, uh, is, is Tim. I founded a company called Fiscal Note, uh, actually originally out in Silicon Valley, and moved the company here to Washington uh, about five or six years ago. Um, we are now the largest uh, technology startup here in the dis District of Columbia. Um, we have raised just under about a quarter billion dollars in venture capital. Uh, investors like Mark Cuban, Jerry Yang, uh, Steve Case, NEA, First Round, uh, and a whole host of other folks. Um, you know, I think that uh, you know, we started our company with the thesis that uh, you know, we could apply artificial intelligence into a wide a variety of different sectors, uh, starting with legal, but now pushing into construction, real estate, healthcare, uh, oil and gas, pharmaceuticals, and, 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 and the like. Um, we have operations both here in, in DC, but also, of course, uh, around the country in, in New York, uh, Louisiana, St. Louis, uh, Los Angeles, um, and then uh, internationally in, in uh, India, Korea, uh, South America, as well as in Hong Kong. Wow. Um, I think on that note, did you did you see any differences in the geographic locations that kind of made you change your approach in terms of how you fundraised? Uh, you know, we we are very blessed to have uh, a wide variety of uh, institutional investors from uh, uh, not just around the U.S. but actually around the world. Yeah. Um, uh, actually, one of our largest institutional investors is uh, Tomasek out in Singapore, uh, which has been making a substantial amount of investments uh, in both American companies as well as global companies. Um, so I think that. Um, one of the things that I've consistently found is that the availability of capital is quite um, wide and diverse, um, and not just in terms of geographic uh, opportunity, but also in terms of the types of capital that are out there. So, um, you know, certainly there's uh, uh, you know very expensive equity capital that exists uh, in the form of venture capital. Uh, you know, the, the funds have specific return rates that they have to uh, to to, uh, to surpass, but. Um, there are a, quite a wide number of different capital partners that can exist, whether it's uh, corporate strategics, uh, family offices, uh, sovereign wealth funds, um, uh, you know, different pockets of different uh, strategies that different private equity funds or hedge funds use. And so uh, for a variety of different purposes, whether it's been for acquisitions or for growth capital, for uh, you know, credit financing, whatever it is, we've been able to sort of tap into multiple different streams of capital in, in different parts of the capital structure. Hmm. That's great. Lindsay, I wanted to ask you a question. So you've personally led, I believe this number is right, over 1,200 seed and early stage deals. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to talk to you, you. about <laughs> investing at the, at the seed stage. I mean, I think we, sure. we talk a lot about venture capital and kind of those Series A, Series B uh, rounds. But I think a lot of high impact investing also happens at the seed stage. Can you talk yeah. a about that and what you've learned? Yeah, so seed stage investing, um, if you, just to kind of map out the spectrum, it's pre-seed, which I call like the F cubed, which is friends, family, and fools, okay? <laughs> and then, because <laughs> your grandma gave you like five grand to try to get your business moving. Um, and, then, and then there's seed, and that capital is used to actually seed the business and figure out, okay, is there something that is possibly scalable here? Um, it's incredibly high risk, so it is a volume game. So you can expect that 80% of the investments that you make um, aren't gonna go as planned. <laughs> um, that said, um, Getting into seed is incredibly important. Um, one, if you look at some of the seed stage investors, we'll take a company like Pinterest, for example. Someone who put $50,000 into Pinterest now has $250 million in their bank account, okay? So just like drink that in for a moment in time. <laughs> Woo! Um, 
So it's exciting in that regard, but it's actually incredibly impactful if done right. So um, the reason I'm so passionate about seed stage deals is because if you think about building a house, you have to lay the foundation appropriately because everything you build on top of that is going to push, you know, push back down on the foundation. So in order to set companies up for success, I'm a huge advocate of making sure that those companies have market standard deal, st deal style terms. You know, a lot of companies in seed, they're trying to be real scrappy and they're thinking I'm taking on money from this person and that person, all these different terms, it's all wonky and whatever. It just makes it unattractive to a future investor because sometimes investors are lazy. <laughs> and so they look at it and they're like, whoa, you got 19 notes out there, all with different terms, hard pass. Um, so uh, for me, it's, it's about setting up these companies in a very strategic way so that when a future investor comes and says, oh my gosh, this group of uh, you know, investors, they, they worked with this company to say, wow, they really laid the groundwork to not only develop the base of the company, the team, et cetera, but now they've set it up so they've made it attractive for future financing so that you're more likely to attract capital, which in turn should drive down, in at least my portfolio, drive down that 80% failure rate. Uh, so yeah, we've had, a, we've had a lot of success in that and you get to see tons of stuff. A lot of, at, at Launch New York anyway, we're industry agnostic, so I invest in anything from life sciences to ed tech to you name it everything in between so it's uh, it's been a, a really wild ride but it's a lot it's a lot of fun mm -hmm. <laughs> I can only imagine and do you Ali do you guys at village capital do you do at the seed stage investing or are you a little bit later on we do we're largely seed stage um, and that can vary so we invest both in the US um, in sub-saharan Africa India and Latin America so seed stage can vary based on the market um, both geography and the sector that uh, we're investing in um, but typically our first check is um, fifty to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars and then we obviously have some capital reserved um, for follow on and one of the things that we talk about a lot that's important at the seed stage is building social capital. Um, there are a lot of entrepreneurs who may have a great network, may have connections, may have the friends, family and fools, but not all of them do. Um, and so how do you get a business started? How do you get, get a business going if you don't have access um, to the financial capital and sort of really focusing on how do we help entrepreneurs make connections to social capital that can turn into financial capital later on, I think is critical at the seed stage. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was curious to hear from all of you, uh, you know, some of your success stories. A lot of you, you know, you all work with entrepreneurs very closely. Um, so, you know, what are some of the lessons learned, some of the success stories you've seen working with entrepreneurs who have, who have raised capital well or, or maybe at the inverse not so well? What, what are some of the pitfalls there? I, I think one of the um, companies I was invested in, uh, I almost call it death by a thousand paper cuts because she never raised enough at one time. It was always 25 here, 50 here, 150 there. And she spent her whole time, and I would love to hear, Tim, your uh, opinion about how much time and energy it takes to fundraise. And so if you're always fundraising, you're not focused on the business, or you're really just diluting your efforts. And so I would say from, a, a, you know, from a, an advice perspective, you know, thinking bigger, if you can build a bigger picture and raise a larger tranche of money, making sure that you need the money. I mean, don't just raise money to, to take money because as he said, equity capital is the most expensive kind. But looking at the different ways that you can properly capitalize your business, um, she did finally find an, an exit. She was acquired, uh, but she had, you know, constantly she had customers, she had contracts, but she didn't have the cash to deliver. And that's a lot of people miss that. You can go out and get customers, but you also have to have the cash to be able to deliver on your contracts. And so I would love to, to hear, I mean, the amount of time yeah. to raise money. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the, the, the advice that I give to a lot of early stage founders is that you don't want to waste your time. And so, um, you know, every investor, you know, given their uh, fund restrictions, their LP relationships, whatever it is, um, has a very specific strategy that they're deploying. It could be, you know, certain check size, certain ownership stake, could be certain uh, stage of company, whatever the case is. And uh, what a lot of founders do is they get really excited or, you know, they start along this, this war path of trying to, to raise capital and they start having all these conversations. Um, and there's just a complete waste of time because, you know, their company's strategy doesn't fit with the fund strategy that the Perfect. investors are trying to deploy. Um, it's uh, nothing, to, that's nothing wrong with the business. It's just that they need to be very targeted about their messaging as well as the strategy that they have going out into the market. 
Hmm. Yeah, and actually that's something that we spend a lot of time helping entrepreneurs on as well. Um, we, we say we're teaching entrepreneurs how to speak investor, um, but essentially a lot of times what happens in this situation is an entrepreneur and an investor will meet. An investor can't say exactly why they're not going to invest. They're just like, this isn't a fit for my strategy. An entrepreneur hasn't articulated clearly um, what milestones that they are striving toward in order to be a fit with that investor at some other point in time. And so um, providing, uh, one of the things that we've tried to do is provide a framework where an entrepreneur and investor can sit across the table um, and be speaking the same language, whether or not that's a fit at that particular time or they're building a relationship for the long term. Um, being able to articulate as an investor what milestones you're looking for um, at what particular stage, uh, whether it's in team, whether it's in vision, product market fit, ability to scale, et cetera. Um, and same goes for the entrepreneur. How do I identify the milestones that I've reached and that I'm building towards? And being able to have that common language, I think, is something that's really important. I think, I think the fact that you're getting um, investors to say no thank you, that's huge. Because most <laughs> investors won't. Mm -hmm. They'll just say, you know, they, they, just, they won't, they rarely say no because they don't want to pass up but they don't say yes either. And so you kind of keep, I don't know how many entrepreneurs, oh yeah, we're gonna close this, we're gonna close this, we're gonna close, do you have a term sheet yet? Well, no, but they're really interested. <laughs> no, they're just not that into you. <laughs> yeah. It's true in startups too. Yeah, um, and then to kind of go off some of that, I think some of the things that not only are we trying, at, at Launch New York, we help entrepreneurs, but we also are an investor, so we're like a kinder, gentler investor, if you will. Um, but the biggest thing we're looking for, and I would advocate that anyone who's thinking about investing in this room is looking for, I call it grit. Um, you know, we can have an argument about whether that is uh, learned or you're born with it. I believe you're born with it. Either you have it or you don't have it. And fundraising is hard. There's a lot that goes into it. Um, you know, every time you think you're, you're going to cross a line and you, and you hit a hurdle, um, some people just aren't able to cross over that one additional hurdle to, to make that additional leap or step. You know, I just got off the phone with an entrepreneur a day ago that said, I need $11,000 to finish out my prototype and then I can... I can do this and I'm going to tap into this $10 million market. So I was like, so let me understand. You need $11,000 and you'll get $10 million theoretically. He's like, yeah. I said, have you done everything? He said, yeah, I've tried everything. I said, did you sell your car? Did you sell your house? Did you sell your furniture? You know, like that's the kind of stuff you're actually looking for in an entrepreneur. Not that they have to actually do it, but are they willing to take that leap? Are they willing to take that additional step? You know, look, I'm not advocating that people all liquidate their homes, but I am <laughs> advocating that they are willing to say, I believe in this business so much that I am going to go ahead and I'm going to sacrifice these things that mean something to me because at the end of the day, I'm going to be able to buy 30 more of them if I actually hit this, hit these milestones and do whatever. So, you know, for me, I, I'm really looking for those entrepreneurs and they are diamonds in the rough. Like that's also why there's an 80% failure rate because not all entrepreneurs have the grit to be successful. And so you really have to dive into that team and those entrepreneurs and say, you know, do you guys have it or do you not? And that's hard to tell and sometimes you don't find out until you're married. <laughs> Hence the 80%. Yep. Uh -huh. yep. <laughs> Good point. Um, Julie, this question's for you. You run a very diverse array of programs at the University of Maryland. You run Tech Transfer, two incubators, Small Business Development Center, an angel fund, I believe. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to us about kind of the spectrum of capital that you see at the state level and, and then even from your perspective back in government at the national level <laughs> available uh, beyond maybe just strictly venture capital? Yeah, sure. So we're very fortunate in Maryland to have um, have early stage like translational research dollars, which come from the state of Maryland, to fund um, great research that maybe needs a prototype or a minimum viable product to, to get it further down the pipe. And that's not all states have that. I believe Ohio has that. I know that uh, Virginia has that. There are a number of places that have that, but people, and these are grants, so you're not having to get up, give up anything. Um, we also help a lot of our entrepreneurs who have a technical, comp a technical uh, company with small business innovation research, SBI. America, they call it America's Seed Fund for a reason. And we're actually hosting the SBIR road tour in Maryland in September. And yes, it takes a long time to get the money. And yes, it's competitive, but so is fundraising. And this is non-dilutive capital. And so we see a lot of SBIR. Um, you know, you can get, uh, you can get overburdened going after 
um, a bunch of pitch competitions for 10,000, 15,000, 25,000. There's pros and cons because, as you said, it gives you um, credibility. The SBIR program gives you a lot of credibility. So you have to really balance that out. You know, I've seen companies that are all sizzle and no substance. So you just have to always do that check to make sure that you're getting a bunch of PR, but there's actually something behind it and you're making traction with your clients. Um, and so we try to really encourage, we did have one professor who had invented a way to make wood as hard as steel and also to make wood transparent. And this was published in Nature Magazine. And he got an unsolicited term sheet from Silicon Valley for $1.2 million. And we said, no, don't do this. It's too early. Because he would have had to give up everything. And there are other types of non-dilutive capital available. And so really understanding and, and being curious to your resourcefulness, right? Um, I, I love the thing that if you're not willing to put all of your stuff in, why would you ask somebody else to put their hard-earned capital in? Mm. Right, yeah. so exhausting every opportunity. Yeah, and Ali, you at Village Capital, there's quite a work that you guys do beyond the, the seed stage investing, also looking at kind of more alternative financing. Can you talk a little bit about that in case the audience isn't familiar with it? Sure, and I was glad, Tim, that you brought up there are many different paths to financing your company. Um, venture capital sort of captures all of the headlines, but the reality is it is a um, less than 1% of companies ever access venture capital. So um, we're particularly interested. Yes, we do have a fund that invests typically in equity structure. Um, but we're particularly interested in emerging um, momentum around alternatives to equity. So a couple of the companies that we've supported have had line of sight. I'll actually talk about a specific company. There's a company called Spensa Technologies. It's an ag tech company um, in Lafayette, Indiana. And they're basically a hardware and software solution to allow farmers to reduce the use of pesticides by better measuring the number of insects in the field. And um, when they came into our portfolio, they already had a um, actually paying customers. So we were in a position where we were able to say, instead of providing an equity investment, why don't we look at something like a revenue share? Um, and essentially, we took a percentage of top line revenue until they had a target uh, that uh, they were paying us back until. And they actually raised a Series A on top of that. So they paid us back early. We participated in the Series A, and the company was later sold. Um, and so we're really excited about the return. But the reason why uh, revenue share worked for them at the time. It was much more founder friendly. We weren't taking a percentage of the company. Um, they already had, again, line of sight into revenue. And there's an emerging um, sort of school of thought that there is an opportunity to make decent returns for investors, sometimes better than the seed stage class. Um, by investing in companies who actually have revenue and are building their businesses based on real revenue versus just reinvesting in growth. So um, there's a company called IndyVC that is running an experiment right now with about eight companies specifically looking at how do you take a venture-like approach to building companies using this more revenue share-based model. So there's a lot of really interesting things happening in this space, yeah. for sure. Definitely. Um, Tim, I was curious about the decision that you made to move your company from Silicon Valley to DC, um, though not exactly the same. I, I imagine a lot of audience members are considering doing a soft landing <coughs> in the US. And you know, relocating is hard. It's a tough decision. Um, can you talk about you know, why you made that decision and, and you know, even how you found the investors moving from Silicon Valley to DC to very different markets? Yeah, you know, uh, uh, a lot of people who know me very, very well uh, will know that I am a uh, a very, very anti-Silicon Valley person. Uh, <laughs> um, there's, there's a whole host of reasons that I won't get into all of those, but um, uh, I think that fundamentally what it came down to was uh, customers, um, and we wanted to be close to our customers. Mm. Um, we are a B2B enterprise software company. Um, you know, we uh, do have a lot of customers here in the Washington region. We started off in our, in our, our first product was a legal AI product, um, and so, Washington being, of course, the highest concentration of lawyers, uh, I think, in the world, <laughs> um, was a, a natural fit for us. Um, you know, there, there are pluses and minuses uh, from being outside the valley. Uh, I actually have not found that uh, technical talent is the largest challenge. I, I found that uh, sales and marketing talent is probably the hardest. Uh, and generally speaking, you know, Silicon Valley does have substantial amounts of, of technology. Uh, uh, business expertise, um, you know, uh, given the concentration of companies like Oracle, uh, companies like Salesforce um, that have built very, very sizable companies. 
Um, and the, the challenge, of course, I think is when you're, when you're very small, you know, when you have sort of 10, 20, 50 folks, um, I think it's, it's, it is easy, uh, easier to find a team that, that can fit, that can work together and scale a business. Um, once you start trying to hire at scale, you know, at the 200 mark, the 500 mark, the 1,000 person mark, mm -hmm. it is substantially more difficult to attract talent um, and to try and build an organization. Um, particularly, uh, this is a challenge we have now, which is, you know, mid-level or sort of L3, L4 level managers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the reality is that if you are a, you know, high-flying manager at um, Salesforce or IBM or Oracle, you're probably at the peak of your career. Um, you know, you're probably 10, 15, 20 years into your career. Um, you know, you're uh, crushing sales quotas, you're sort of uh, delivering for your organization. Um, and so for a scaling organization, it's actually substantially difficult uh, to try and attract that level of talent, especially if you're trying to move them from outside of the, their core markets. Um, so I actually go back and forth on this quite a bit because we, um, you know, I think that in, in the long run, it was definitely the best thing for us at the time to move um, out of the valley um, into Washington. Great for our customers, got the business off the ground. Uh, but to be honest, uh, and I'll be very honest here, I, I sort of slowly see our organization scaling some of our operations back onto the West Coast, mm. uh, particularly as we start scaling the company. And it's largely because um, that, that L3, L4 level talent is you know, substantially difficult to, uh, difficult to come by. Um, it's also one of the reasons why we sort of looked um, very globally as we scaled our operations. But, um, you know, definitely, you know, as a startup um, in the early stages of our company, I think you can start a company anywhere. Um, you can start a company, uh, you know, in an emerging market. You can start a company in, 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 in a non-Silicon Valley, non-New York market. Um, but I think the, the scaling challenges are definitely, uh, you know, segregated and separate from, uh, from, from, the, from the startup challenges for sure. Yeah, and can you talk to us about kind of when you made the decision to make the leap in terms of doing, you know, basically seeking out equity investment in your company? Um, and how you found those initial investors? Yeah, um, so we bootstrapped our company um, in the very beginning. Uh, you know, it was uh, summer savings, and uh, I started the company when we were 21 years old, straight out of college. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, you know, we were, we were literally, we went out to Silicon Valley not because um, uh, there was anything special about Silicon Valley, it was just because that was like the right thing to do. Um, <laughs> and uh, you know, we, we had maybe bootstrapped a, you know, twenty or thirty thousand dollars, and we're living out of a Motel Six because we couldn't afford an apartment. Um, and so um, that's, that's grit right there, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was uh, up until our fifth employee. You know, we were li living out of this Motel Six room, and it was two guys, uh, you know, sleeping on each bed, and one person sleeping on the floor. Um, and that was basically our first office. Uh, and uh, uh, but I, I do remember, I think we, we, had, we all had a discussion one evening, um, and, I, and we, were, we were just talking about the company. Uh, we had gotten maybe 20 or 30 beta customers. One of them uh, had just contracted over to paying. Um, I was saying, guys, we, we really need to, we need to raise capital for this business. Uh, we can't keep doing this. This is pretty unsustainable. Um, so uh, we have a, a, little bit, a little bit of an unusual story, because we actually um, I, I went on Google and I, I, I cold emailed Mark Cuban. Um, <laughs> so I, I went on, on Google, searched Mark Cuban's email, um, shot him a cold email, and then literally within 45 minutes he responded. Um, and he wrote the first you know, $740,000 check into the business. Wow. Yes. Um, and then from there, you know, Jerry Yang and Steve Case and, and NEA sort of syndicated onto the, onto the capital raise. So I, I wouldn't say that we, um, we're, we're definitely lucky because we didn't have to, um, we didn't have to go through the full road show, if you will, um, for our seed round. Um, uh, what I will say in retrospect is that it was very painful and very expensive uh, to have to give up that much of the of the business that early on. Um, and uh, you know, when you when you when you when you start getting into the late stages of, of the, the business and you start thinking about exit or IPO or whatever it is, um, the uh, <laughs> the formula is very simple. It's how much of the business do you own and how much is the business worth. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, the reality is that those early early stages. You know, the first seed Series A is, is where you give up the biggest chunks of your company. Um, and so I was telling this to another founder last weekend that if I were to do it again, I would definitely have waited out a little bit longer, um, you know, to, to, to sort of, you know, uh, force less dilution on, on our management. Um, but I think, you know, uh, the seed round was, was, you know, I think very frothy when we raised capital, probably 2013 or so. Mm. Um, series A was where it got very, very difficult. Um, the... Uh, uh, they call it the Series A crunch, right? The, um, there's such a wide availability of angel and seed capital, uh, particularly um, you know in the last couple of years, 
Um, and, but the number of institutional Series A investors has actually not grown substantially. Um, and so um, you have this massive funnel of companies coming in, and then the bar just consistently goes up uh, for companies to raise institutional capital. Um, so um, in every, every year when I talk to founders, it seems like the bar keeps going up. <laughs> um, and I'm not sure we would have been able to raise Series A maybe a couple of years ago. But um, and that bar just keeps moving up you know, for each of the later stages. And so um, uh, it does, it, it, it's a forcing mechanism, in my opinion, for you to have more disciplined operations and more capital efficiency. Um, and that's something that we've, uh, you know, I think we, we were very, very cognizant of uh, you know, very early on in the business. Yeah. What, you know, you've mentioned one thing that you would do differently. I'm curious if there's anything else in the fundraising process, because I think now you've raised over 50 million, your, your Series D. Um, curious, you know, just for individuals who are looking to finance their company, what, what big lessons you took away from that? Uh, I think that, um, I think that uh, founders, I mean, the, the big lesson is that founders uh, really just think that there's only one type of capital. Um, and uh, as we've scaled our business, um, you know, we have, we, we've played every level of the capital structure uh, <laughs> like an orchestra. <laughs> um, senior debt, subordinated debt, convertible yeah. notes, uh, preferred equity, common equity, uh, basically straight up and down, uh, you know, and then, you know, working directly with governments on um, government grants, uh, on working on AR type financing, um, on uh, recurring revenue type facilities, uh, on uh, revenue share agreements, joint venture agreements, licensing agreements, whatever it is to access capital, um, you know, both from a capital structure perspective as well as from an operating perspective. Um, and this is why I tell our managers and our executive team every quarter when we do sort of a, a, an operational review of the business, which is that you know, as we get closer and closer to this exit period, it is a very, very simple formula. It's how much of the business do we own and how much is this business worth? Um, and we just keep reminding ourselves um, you know, as we sort of think about our, our own financial outcomes. And so um, uh, you know, I think from a capital and fundraising perspective, Really thinking critically about what are, did I did I exhaust all the alternative forms of capital um, that that are that are available to me and I, I to, now I actually think that um, you know equity capital is the last resort of capital financing mm. um, you know when when we go to finance an acquisition or we go to raise uh, you know another round of capital whatever it is um, you know we think what are what are the cheapest forms of capital we can get first and then what's the last the, the last stage we can get to and so even you know, as we consider a public offering or whatever the case is, um, you know, a lot of my colleagues uh, just bypass the entire capital market. They say, we'll just do a direct listing. Uh, we don't need, we don't need to raise capital. Um, and once we do the direct listing, we'll, uh, you know, we'll go raise, uh, you know, cheaper forms of debt capital, or whatever the case is. So, um, you know, I think uh, thinking very creatively, um, not just about your business uh, and the product, but also about the financing mechanisms are, uh, it's probably the, the biggest thing that, I, that at least I would do, you know, over again, you know, from the very beginning. Yeah, that's fantastic advice. Well, I wanted to open it up to questions from the audience. Um, if any of you have specific questions for these guys, yeah, go ahead. I think there's a microphone over here as well. If you'd like to speak into that, I think so. Yeah, I think it should be on. Hi there. Uh, my name is Tom Tyler. I'm from Elites, part of the London Stock Exchange Group. Uh, we support growing businesses expanding internationally. I concur completely with Lindsay's point about Ohio. We decided that Ohio was the right place for us to start our business in the United States. So we're, uh, we're yeah. welcoming and encouraging uh, all the international companies that we work with to come to the United States. And it happens to be Ohio is where we started in Columbus. And I, th I think I'm meeting some of your colleagues later this week, actually. Oh. Um, <laughs> but uh, my question was really for international companies coming here, especially in the scale up phase, um, what percentage of your allocation of capital is going to international companies? And is that a growing portion of the capital that you're investing? Mm -hmm. um, so my capital through Launch New York is focused on companies that base themselves or have offices in the 27 westernmost counties of the state of New York. So that's sort of an economic pull to draw them there. I mean, they could start in Taiwan, they could start wherever, but they have to relocate to the Launch New York territory to receive investment from there. Um, then on my you know, more traditional venture capital side of the house. Um, 
you know, we for a long time were very, uh, I would say, regionally focused, and that being in the Midwest because we believe that venture is a contact sport. But what we've started to do is um, bring on venture partners that focus on very targeted areas. So we it allowed us to sort of broaden our depth across the globe slowly. So we're actually moving more into uh, what we call like Pacific Rim, um, you know, into Singapore and stuff like that with um, our next our next fund that we're seeking to raise. Um, so in terms of allocation, it'll probably be you know 15% of the portfolio that's more international based. Um, but we do always kind of say, oh, how do we also draw that group more into you know our normal home base of call it Midwest, like even if we can get you to Chicago, we're still excited about that because we can get in the car and show up at your door in four hours. <laughs> so, so whether something's going really well or not as well, we can still find you. <laughs> but yeah, so to answer your question, probably 15% in an international, but if someone relocates to our, um, to our more traditional zones, then that's where we spend our money. So uh, from, from our perspective, so we have two things. We have something called the Momentum Fund, which is, um, it was about $10 million that was carved out of our endowment, which is based on being located, kind of, it's a place-based investment. But we also have a soft landing incubator, an international incubator that is a soft landing. So it doesn't have to be your world headquarters, but your US headquarters have to be located in Maryland to qualify for these investments. But um, we are in the process of, I'm trying to, get the bureaucracy out of my way. We're, we're, we've had interest in raising an alumni fund, which would be international. So, um, but the affinity would be that you have one or more founders that was from the University of Maryland. And we would invest in you no matter where you are in the world. So there, there usually has to be some type of a thesis around it's either a problem you're trying to solve or um, some type of an affinity. There is a lot of the, I'll call them economic development types of funding, which can be tricky and Maryland has gotten a little tripped up in that in the last year. Um, but it's possible. You just have to be very transparent and consistent and fair, and that's, that's part of what we're working on. So we've kind of got both. Awesome. Any other questions from the audience? Yeah, go ahead. Use the microphone if possible, maybe. <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is Emine Riahi. I'm the co-founder of the startup Epilert. I want to ask about uh, how do you define scalability in uh, innovation projects and innovation idea for, uh, pers from the uh, investor perspective? Thank you. Mm. About it? you go, go for it. Go ahead. Um, well, certainly scalability can be defined differently depending on the market and the sector um, that we're looking for. Um, you know, um, I would say uh, for us, uh, we look at companies who can capture uh, at least a billion dollar market um, over the long term. So, um, and a, obviously a percentage of that. Um, that's a typical seed stage uh, definition of scalability. Um, different investors will tell you what scalability looks like over time. Venture investors are usually looking for that scalability a lot faster. Um, and again, going back to the sort of alternatives to equity um, and finding more patient capital. Um, if you have an innovation that may take you a little bit more time to get into a very entrenched market, whether it's you know a gov government dominated market or um, something like healthcare, um, more patient capital may look at that scalability at the same figure, but give you more time to reach that scale. So I don't know if others would. Mm -hmm. no. That's good. Yeah, yeah. 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 go ahead. Well, uh, thank you very much for the explanation. I was wondering about uh, Latin American uh, investments or what countries are uh, like developing more activities or connecting with you guys in terms of you know having uh, some cities there like um, uh, mm -hmm. Argentina or or some countries like Chile. Yeah, yeah. thank you. <laughs> um, been involved in more active in in this type of investment and, and ideas. 
Okay. I can talk about that because yep. we've done quite a bit of in Latin America and we actually have uh, offices both in Bogota and in Mexico City. Um, and we see a lot of energy and enthusiasm both in the financial inclusion, financial health, fintech space. Um, there's a lot of interesting things happening there um, and in the healthcare space. Um, so there's a, for example, we're invested in a company that's uh, working on a telemedicine solution in Costa Rica, for example. Um, and that's something that is very translatable to the US. Um, so those are two sectors that we're excited about in Latin America. Lots of activity. We, we first started in Mexico, um, but we see lots of energy and activity in Chile and Colombia and Argentina. So we're really excited about those markets as well. I mean, the reason, so this is actually an answer to an earlier question. We invest in companies that are seed stage, so usually they're really focused on their home market. Um, but the reason that they're interested in working with us is because ultimately they want to scale globally and we have access to these other markets where we invest in, including in the US. Thank you. Yeah. Hmm. Harvey, the name of your company in Mexico City? Village Capital. Village Capital? Yep. <laughs> you saw one hand back there. Oh, behind right you. There. Behind you. Hi, uh, this is Mangish. Uh, I'm founder of uh, Velox Solution Private Limited. Uh, we are based at Mumbai, India. And R is actually a cybersecurity company. There are only three companies worldwide who made invention in terminal security. Our company is, uh, is one of them. So. Uh, we established in 2012. We are doing very well in India. M I have two questions. How this invention be funded? That is one. And do you have any central agency located here in Washington, D.C., or an uh, or state agency which will help us to grow in this country? Thank you. So I know uh, we have a cybersecurity soft landing incubator uh, associated with the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, UMBC. I'm happy to give you information. Um, they're in partnership with Northrop Grumman, and they're right down the highway from the National Security Agency, NSA. So there's a lot of cybersecurity in, within Maryland because we are so uh, government central. So happy to share. It's specifically for cyber companies. There's also a cyber accelerator in uh, Northern Virginia called Mach 37, too. So it might be looking at. Not to not veer people away from Maryland first. <laughs> no, it's all right. No, I'm not one of those. <laughs> Hello, my name is Christian. Um, and I have a question. What, uh, what is the number of companies that are selling services and you invested uh, in them rather than mm. products? Yeah, so Percentage. sure. Um, uh, typically, especially when you're you're uh, seeking equity capital, and I'm going to specifically only talk about that in this instance right now, um, it is a little bit harder to um, get that type of funding when you are a services focused business because typically services focused business only scale with humans and humans are expensive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, it, it becomes a little bit challenging. So if there is a play where, yes, you have to add humans for sales or marketing, et cetera, but there's an efficiency play with technology that's going to expedite the growth. Um, you know, yeah, so maybe there's services associated with that technology, but the technology is actually the driver. That company is substantially more likely to get investment dollars. That said, if we go back to what some of the other folks have been talking about, if you're not looking for equity capital and maybe you're looking for straight debt capital or you know, maybe you're financing um, or you know, investing in humans that are you know, people of, of different ethnic backgrounds, et cetera, there might be um, programs that offer substantial amounts of funding, sometimes even grant dollars, to bring on those, those individuals and help grow your business. Um, so in my portfolio, typically I'm not a services business. I am either I either have products or I have technology so that's but that's in specifically my portfolio I started my company as a services company and then we developed software that we retained ownership for and we sold to other people so that arrangement I didn't have to give up any equity for that because I had my customer funded the development but I my arrangement was I gave them a royalty when I sold it to other customers so I would always I tell services company if if you're looking for an exit 
services companies are great. You can build great big services companies. And um, I'm going to guess that if you're solving some problems in a specific market, there might be some equity capital for you. Um, but if you want to eventually sell for some multiplier, usually I think that services companies aren't a huge multiplier. Yeah, um, yeah it, you want to create some type of a product. But I'm guessing, do you guys have any services companies in specific solving problems? We don't have any sort of traditional services companies, but we do have a number of companies that started out as services businesses, saw an opportunity to build technology, particularly yeah. in the workforce uh, space. So we do a lot of work in education. We've sort of evolved our ed tech investing to adult learning. Um, and workforce development, and, and that's a sector we see a lot of people who started services businesses saw an opportunity to build a tech platform. So. Yeah. 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 So for sure, everybody knows Theranos. Oh, sorry. Uh, for sure, everybody knows Theranos, and you know Theranos mm -hmm. and their failure, actually. Uh, how would you consider investing in a product that's already existing and it's similar with Theranos? So. Um, yeah, that's, show me the science. So, yeah, <laughs> right. Um, you know, there was a, there was what happened in, in the Theranos uh, situation was that um, there was a lot of a lot of hype and a lot of sheep following other sheep, not knowing where the first sheep were going. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, there wasn't one failure; there was systemic failure in in that situation. So, initial folks doing due diligence didn't do due diligence the way due diligence should be done. They didn't dive in and say, "Okay, walk me into the lab so that I can see how this thing is unfolding, watch the output, see end result." Instead, they allowed a very dynamic individual. Um, to kind of say, look over here. Well, like something went out the back door and, and, and all of that. So, um, you know, that kind of story gets a lot of press because it is scandalous. It is sexy for the press to talk about this, you know, negative, horrible thing where $9 billion were lost, and that's awful. But um, there are definitely ways to avoid that situation, and the, the best way is to do your homework. You know, we do due diligence for a reason. We vet technology, and it seems annoying to entrepreneurs, but we're doing it because we take other people's money and we give it to you. We have a fiduciary responsibility to do the right thing. So when someone comes and says, let me, you know, look under the hood and vet this technology, just agree with them. <laughs> let them do it, because they, they actually want to prove, like, yeah, this, this, they said they was doing the thing, and it's doing the thing, and I want to invest in this and give it money. So at the end of the day, systemic failure, unfortunate story. It's going to make for a great movie, you know, if it hasn't already started. I don't know. But, you know, <laughs> it was just it was problematic from day one. Actually, I'm uh, speaking about a product that was already existing in Europe. Sure. So you want to make it a startup here in uh, USA. So, so same thing. We're going to go ahead and we're going to vet that technology. We're going to examine it. You're going to bring, you know, you're going to reach out to investor. You're going to say, hey, I have this product. It does X, Y, and Z. We're going to test that it does X, Y, and Z. And if it does, awesome. And if it does not, we just want to know what went wrong and if it can actually do X, Y, and Z eventually. Uh, hi, uh, we are a uh, fintech insurtech company. Uh, are you considering uh, the uh, not startup company in uh, its original country, but here in uh, the startup? And how uh, you are approaching the insurtech within the fintech or as a separate line of business? Insurtech, insurance. Sure. Um, so is insurtech. Uh, differentiated from fintech. I mean, I think it depends on what your business actually does and the problem that it solves within insuretech or fintech. Um, those things tend to kind of bleed together in some capacities, but maybe in some things they're they're very much different lines. Um, so I think as you're evaluating how you're talking about your company, you know, is your end customer insurance company or is it, you know, banking provider or is it someone else? And that's going to help you kind of delineate and clarify your story more. So that way you can explain, you know, I'm an insure tech company in the fintech space or I'm a fintech company or I'm an insure tech company. And I will tell you any of those right now is probably a fine answer because those are all hot spaces. It's just making sure your story is clear. 
And, and I would also add, um, as this is where having a partner on the ground here. So we've had a number of companies that are that are not startup companies in their home country, but who come here to start their U.S. operations. And one of the important things about finding a partner on the ground, either a soft landing or an investor, is that they can help you translate your market from your home country to the U.S. Because it might be structured differently. There might be different. For example, um, in the United States, our state let you know our states mandate date water, right? So um, a company that's done a water solution in, in a country will come to the U.S. and realize that there are different regulations from state to state, and how do you navigate that? And so I would suggest that if you have if you have an existing company, you've, ex you've had success in your country, it still is helpful to have a U.S. partner who can help walk you through the difference in industry and your demographics and your customer base because there are probably, and, and even cultural differences, because there probably are quite a few that you might not be aware of. Just, just on that note, if I can make a small plug, we, yes. we actually do have uh, a part of our operations that invests pretty substantially in foreign businesses that want to do joint ventures hmm. in the artificial intelligence space here in the U.S. That's good. Um, and so, you know, between you know a million and five million dollars, we will finance, capitalize, uh, you know, these existing joint ventures with uh, you know larger businesses that want to come into the U.S. and apply some 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 of their sort of core operations, whatever the case is. And so, um, uh, you know, our pitch, of course, is. You know, we can structure those either as uh, you know equity-based joint ventures, uh, where you you know you retain the majority of the ownership. Um, we will also do sort of structuring as revenue share agreements or IP licensing agreements. Um, and so, nice. there's a wide variety of different ways in which uh, both uh, our company as well as a wide variety of American companies mm -hmm. uh, can partner with with foreign businesses who want to do business in the U.S. Absolutely, great, right? That's good. To know. I think we got time for one more question. Hi. Um, yes, my name is Alan. Uh, I'm from Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, my company is in Vietnam called HBC. We have about 16,000 employees. And we currently move to about four or five countries. This time I'm coming to US to look for a partner mm -hmm. that we can, uh, because in our construction business, we have a lot of connection in building new, uh, new city, new urban areas. Mm -hmm. And the real estate market in Canada and Vietnam is, is, is well, I'm both Canadian and Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are very very uh, effective. Mm -hmm. Like you can sell all your products even before you launch it. Mm -hmm. So that's that's how good the market is. And I'm just wondering if um, any of you have the connection to any investor uh, that interested in investing in new tech city, like real estate plus high tech, like mm -hmm. smart city and uh, new way of constructing home and uh, towers yeah. that save like 40, 50%. So I'm just waiting, uh, I'm mm. just wondering if <laughs> yeah. any of you so, interested, any, any investors? So um, I would tell you to answer yes. But uh, <laughs> I would also tell you to look, when you're looking at the US, there's a number of cities that are focused on what we call smart cities initiatives. Columbus, Ohio is one of those cities. Um, so, <laughs> um, so uh, an example, they won a, um, a grant from uh, the Department of Transportation, and then that was matched with $500 million of private dollars. So there is money in this space, and so I would tell you, let's you know, let's just have a quick discussion after it because, you know, I, I know plenty. Thank you very much. Yeah. And I'd you also much. just yeah. very quickly, if you haven't already looked at investors who are building out funds focused on opportunity zones, so it's yes, a gonna <laughs> legislation, part of the most recent tax legislation, you know, it's, you're nodding your head like you know what it is. So um, there's a lot of interest in real estate right now in the U.S. because mm -hmm. of the opportunity zone mm -hmm. legislation. Last thing I would say also is National League of Cities. Um, that organization is kind of the hub for all of the major smart city efforts, and they could probably do a great job of connecting you with the right people, too. Yes, one more. All right. Hi, this is Mehtaf Chamla. I'm from Pakistan, and my company is $95 million company, mm -hmm. and 70% I'm supplying to the chain stores of America, Tovils. And I have already established a company in New Jersey. My showroom is in New York. If I, uh, we have already started the company just to give the LDP and for the online business. If you will, for instance, if we will invest $5 million into your country, because we are already working with the chain stores of America, 
तो हाउ मच कैन यू ऑफर अस एंड एट व्हाट मार्कअप yeah that's tough i mean so it's hard to give an answer like that without knowing tremendous amounts of detail um so i think as you're talking to any groups who you're discussing your business i'm already supplying to walmart and many chinese stores sure. and i'm very much familiar and they all know me know me very well yeah and i understand that but it's hard for someone to price your deal so they're still going to have to vet your business and they're going to have to go through um you know what is your total business worth so that they can actually price that deal with you well, i I know, but then there's margins, there's a whole bunch of other things. People actually don't always love Walmart because they <laughs> they push down margins so hard that like you don't actually make a lot of money. <laughs> um and maybe you do. Perspective. Yes. Yeah, no, um and so there's so much detail that goes into that financial model that we'd have to understand. So, um I think unfortunately no one here could probably answer that question but with greater detail and understanding i'm sure everyone on the panel could yeah yeah and and unfortunately your company is worth whatever an investor or an acquirer is willing to pay for it and i've had this argument with professors that said well i put 16 million dollars of research into the company it's like yeah investors don't care <laughs> <laughs> yeah all right well thank you all so much let's give a round of applause to our panelists thank you